This was the end of sophomore year of college now. Her and I talked each other into going to the strip club for the first time. So I was 18 years old and uh, I remember walking into the strip club and uh, feeling like a baby deer, but I was willing to make money. It was about money for me. So this is what led me to uh, seeking arrangements and finding sugar daddies and just doing like things I'd never imagined I would ever do for money. So I was blacked out, you know, three to four days out of the week um, mm -hmm. on cocaine. I was messed up every day, yet I was still a straight A student. So nobody ever saw any red flags. Basically, we were naked for the whole weekend. It was naked oh, wow. rituals. Yeah, That's naked cool. rituals. <laughs> So this opens the portal to me going back into the strip clubs again because now sexuality is being very desensitized for me in this quote unquote healing space. So now I'm thinking, okay, me being sexual is a part of me healing, is a part of me empowering my divine feminine, awakening my inner goddess. I was still a full-time student, still teaching yoga, but before I knew it, um, I'm drinking again. I'm doing cocaine in the bathroom with girls again. So now we have this kind of open relationship dynamic. Uh, mm -hmm. where he's coming to the club and getting dances from girls. He starts bringing up ideas of like, you know, we started having like basically uh, like orgies. I'll just say the word, I'll just call it what it is. Like we started yeah. having these, you know, other yeah. couples, other situations. Like we were like hardcore living out a pagan lifestyle. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. I'm excited to bring with me today, Michaela. Michaela has a truly inspiring testimony and I can't wait for you to hear so thank you for being here, Michaela. Thank you so much for having me, Julie. I'm excited to meet you and have the opportunity to be on the show today. I'm so excited for you to share your testimony today. So why don't you start, Michaela, with just your childhood? Because I know a lot started from there. Yeah, of course. So growing up, um, my parents were drug addicts. They were they were young. They weren't looking to, you know, get pregnant with a baby. But here I came, the, the consequences of their actions. But God had a greater plan in that. However, my parents struggled a lot with addictions. This was passed down generation to generation. Um, you know, my dad was the bad boy. Uh, he sold pot and coke. And my mom was attracted to that kind of fast life. So she got together with him and um, they, yeah, they ended up having me. And so Michaela, your mom had you as a teenager, right? Yeah, she was only 18. Um, I think she might have even been pre uh, got pregnant at 17, had me at 18. Um, and so, yeah, her and my dad, they uh, they never really learned to deal with their emotions or hard things in life past the point of substance abusing and numbing those things. So my mom ended up leaving when I was three and I was left with my dad who had, you know, it started, like I said, with marijuana and cocaine, but this grew into deeper and darker things. And he was also a guy who was, like I described before, he's a player. So he's going to the strip clubs, mm. meeting these girls who are doing tarot cards and mm. Ouija boards and all sorts of stuff like this. So this was around me from a very young age. Mm. Um, and I remember seeing like, their sparkly outfits and just being so enamored by that and thinking it was fun and pretty and interesting. So all of this got really desensitized for me from a very young age. Mm. And about what age were you when you, you started like reading books? I remember you had a book about ghosts. <laughs> Tell me about that. Oh my that. gosh. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. So because my parents were involved in so much, you know, substance abuse and the witchcraft of um, substance abusing. This is a portal opener to the demonic mm -hmm. on top of the uh, tarot cards and Ouija boards, you know, the next level of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. um, starting as a young girl, I started seeing what I thought were ghosts. But after I became a Christian years later, I realized that they were really demons this whole time. Um, so when I was young, I would always like I had such a hard time sleeping at night because I would see things. I would wow. see things crawl under my dad's door. And now looking back, I know he would go into his bedroom and do drugs. So I imagine around that time, I'm seeing the demon enter, you know, when he's doing that. And uh, yeah. So How I old were you again? Maybe kindergarten. Oh, wow. Yep. So, so that's it started really young. Yeah. The natural in the demonic realm. Yep. And so this became my obsession. So my first book ever, I think, was in first grade. And the first one was just about dogs. I love dogs. They were my sort of 
safe place, you know, amidst all the mm -hmm. craziness that my dad, you know, because when he would drink or be on drugs, he was very abusive to his girlfriend. So my dog was like my best friend, my safe place. So yeah. my first book was about dogs. And I think it was maybe in third grade, I wrote my first, my second book about ghosts. And I stayed up like so late. I was always asking my grandma to take me to the library. I was researching ghosts and paranormal. And um, I just really believed in the spirit world from a really young age as well, because I'd seen these things. So I was open to believing, you know, I never saw fairies or anything like this, but I believed fairies were real, you know, elves. Like I just believed in, you know, all of the spirit stuff since I'd seen the scary stuff. I had to believe that, you know, there was a bright side out there too. Um, but there was really no talk of Jesus in our household at all mm -hmm. until I think I was nine years old. My mom got out of prison and I would get visitations with her sometimes and though she was substance abusing and Ouija boarding because a lot of her friends would overdose and die because she was a heroin addict. So this was very common. So my mom would use Ouija boards to try to connect with them. And uh, wow. so there was demonic activity around her too, yet she still grew up with a Christian upbringing. She knew about Jesus. She believed in the Bible. So when I told her the kind of things I would see, she mm. was the first person to tell me, if you say, in the name of Jesus, I demand you to leave, that they have to leave. So whether she lived this out or not, this was like wow. the first seed planted for me that like, I don't need to be terrified in my bed all night. Like I can, I maybe have this tool. So she wow. gave me a cross and I came home to my dad's after that weekend with her. And that was one of the first times I tried implementing this. I remember feeling the dark presence enter my room. And I remember oh. standing up. I'm just this little tiny kid with this cross. And I'm like, in the name <laughs> of Jesus, I demand you to leave. And I really did feel like I had a little bit of peace, but I was still so afraid because I didn't fully, I didn't fully understand, you know, Jesus or the cross or my authority mm -hmm. or anything like that. But um, this did seem to help a little bit. And then one of the times, this is actually interesting too. Um, like I said, I'd seen things. And one time I saw this blue lady and this was the first sort of spirit that didn't make me feel afraid. Hmm. And she had a like a covering over her head and her hands were in prayer posture. And there were so many nights that I cried myself to sleep because I would hear my dad beating on his girlfriends. And um, this was one of those nights I was just up and I remember seeing this blue lady in my room and it was the first time I wasn't afraid, though. So, you know, I had my cross. I knew what I could do, but I didn't feel like I needed to. And years, you know, years later, now looking back as a Christian, um, I believe it was Mother Mary who was there and she was praying for me and uh, interceding on my behalf before I even knew anything about her, mm. um, you know, or Jesus, really. I believe that she was there and she knew I would one day come to her son. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that, Michaela. Wow. So this went on for a while and then then tell us then then you graduated obviously over the years but it was a very tough childhood and then yeah. go into that and then into your teenage years. Yeah, so I think the last time I saw anything super spooky like what I saw around my dad was um it was in my at my grandparents' house and I was maybe in third grade. And it was the same like stick figure, like black, tall, skinny, um, corpse bride like being. And this is the one that I'd seen melt under the door and go into his room. And um, I'd seen it walk around the backyard. The last time I saw this one, I was playing in the front yard with my dog. And uh, my dog starts barking, looking at the field. And I look up and I see this being running through the field. And the moment he hits the highway, he poof and vanishes. So that was the last time I saw that one. However, like, you know, I continued to feel like I didn't feel truly safe, but it, it was, you know, the spirit world got a little bit quiet after that. And my dad, um, when he started to get in legal trouble, actually, mm -hmm. uh, we actually went to church a little bit when I was maybe around between 10 and 12 years old. And his pastor or our, our pastor was also my dad's lawyer. So I started to get to hear a little bit, you know, more about Jesus and the Bible. But for me, church was a very unsafe place. For me, it was, you know, dad is beating everybody. We have to fake a smile, not let anybody know anything's going on. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you go into church and, you know, you just had to put on this front. Yeah. And so I never mm -hmm. felt safe at church. Yeah, it was just kind mm -hmm. of, you know, 
like a place we had to be dad's putting on a show, then I'm going to go home and, you know, get my ass beat again. Mm -hmm. Um, So church was, yeah, that was my only association with church. But then when my dad went to prison, when I was 13, he finally got caught for making, selling, using meth. And um, it explained a lot of his erratic, demonic behavior. Um, And so I was able to understand because, you know, there was one side of my dad that was very loving and charming and like a very sweet dad. And there was another side of him that was very dark and demonic and abusive. And uh, that was very confusing for me before Mm -hmm. I grew up and understood the influence of the demonic world and the fact that they were literally invading him and using him. Um, So when he went to prison, it was no more no more church at all. And now I'm living with my grandparents. Um, and I lived with them for a couple years, but they were really, really poor. Uh, so I ended up moving in with an aunt, um, moving schools for the first time at 16. This was kind of my fresh start. I'm like, I'm no longer the addicts kid. I get to start over, um, make a new reputation for myself. Kind of coming into your own, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because of like all, all that I'd been through with my parents, I had a lot of voids I was seeking to fill, and I did that with with drugs, with alcohol, with boys, sleeping around, parties. Um, so I'd really ruined my reputation at my old school, and uh, nobody took me seriously. And so on top of like the suffering of being at home and living in poverty and the, just the stress that that brings to a family, and then also like school used to be my safe place, and it no longer was um, because of what I'd done. Can you share with us a little bit, because you said you started to go into promiscuity and you said drugs too at this early age? Yes. Uh, Tell us about your first experience with, with the boy, that story, as well as, you know, starting your drugs. Yeah. I lost my virginity when I was 12. Mm-hmm. Um, the boy was 16 and, um, you know, I didn't listen to anybody that told me like, Hey, that's weird. (laughs) You know, I was like, no, I'm just mature for my age and which I was, but no, looking back, I'm like, that was very predatory of a 16 year old to go after Mm -hmm. a 12 year old girl. Um, but you don't see that until you're older and, and looking back. And so, you know, I thought I would sneak out and see him and we would maybe like, I would have my first kiss, but no, um, it went all the way. And, um, because I'd grown up being abused for so long, I didn't know how to say no or like speak my boundaries or protect myself or any of that. So um, I just kind of let it happen. It wasn't like I, I didn't directly say yes and I didn't directly say no and it, and it happened. And this became another void of me trying to fill that, like redo that first experience because it was so like bad and cringy. And so I was like, you know, I got to like take my power back in this. And this led to more promiscuity and trying to recreate mm-hmm. that situation Um, And I didn't realize I was just adding more and more trauma. Um, And then my first drug use was, it was pain pills. Um, My friend stole her dad's script and we popped it in the school bathroom. And um, she had an older brother. So we would smoke spice and weed and we would drink. And uh, yeah, that was my youth from 12 on. And, you know, it's it's difficult because you didn't have any parental help parental guidance, you know, and you were just kind of left to your, your own vices and figuring all this out on your own. Yeah, no, I I definitely felt like that. This was how I knew how to fill the voids of, you know, what had been the voids that had been in my heart since, since birth, since childhood. And this is the way I saw my parents fill their voids or at least try to fill their voids. So I continued that cycle without even realizing I was doing that. I always said, I'm going to be nothing like them. I'm going to, you know, go all the way in school and I'm going to be successful. But I was still filling my voids the same way that they did without even realizing I was doing that. you had cried out to God as a little girl and you had some seeds planted with your mom. And he, he, he never obviously gives up on you or us, but tell us about how you know, how you, well, first of all, talk to, talk to us about when some of the things that happened to you before all that led up, you were starting to do things on your own. You were just like, like you said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? Yeah. It's interesting when you say, um, I cried out to God, I did kind of skip over that part of how, you know, when I was in the baby phases of, of learning, you know, that there was a God, um, I remember like just crying and praying in the bathtub and praying for God to get me out of my dad's house. I was praying this every time he would go on one of his rampage. I would, 
rampages, I would just pray to God, get me out of here. Please get me out of here. Please get me out of here. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, yes, that's when he was caught, you know, with the meth and all of that. Um, I d- there was a lot in between there, you know, with different police situations, him getting out, coming back. Um, but he finally went to prison uh, when I was 13. And um, I believe so, you had angels and his protection covering you your whole childhood because you had been through so much and you got yeah. to see little glimpses of him answering your prayers. Yes. So yeah, he's never left you, you know? Yes. And so, okay. So then when I was 16 and I moved in with my aunt, I was like, okay, this is my fresh start. Like I need to, you know, my aunt was like, I want you to just be a kid for once. Um, she wanted to just provide a stable home for me to finally be able to focus on school and, you know, making something of myself. And uh, I still struggled because I still had those old coping habits. But um, yeah, so the first paranormal experience I had at my aunt's was actually very alarming for me because I thought that all of those things would have stayed in in my hometown. I remember thinking when I moved, I'm like, okay, it was the house that was haunted or it was my dad or like my grandparents. It was stuff that they did. Um, but I had my first sleep paralysis attack when I was 16 Mm. and, uh, I'm in this new house. Like my aunt lives in a brand new house. I'm like, okay, so there's no like ghosts like haunting this house, but I still didn't make the connection that I was opening portals or that I had portals open for these beings to be attached to me. Um, and so I had my first sleep paralysis attack where this dark being is in the corner of the room and I'm, I'm sleeping, but I can see myself sleeping and this being is challenging me. I feel him like threatening me and he's getting closer and closer. And next thing I know, he's hovering completely over top of me and I'm telling him I'm stronger than you. I'm going to wake myself up. And he's like arguing like, no, like I'm stronger than you. And I'm like, no, I'm stronger than you. And finally I wake up and I'm just like gasping for air. And I feel this being like literally in my room. I I know he's there. I know he's in my room. And lucky for me, my cousin had just moved out because she was of age. So I got to move my bedroom upstairs after that. Um, But that next week I went to work. I was working uh, at Steak and Shake waitressing and uh, I'd never seen a Mormon in my life. So when this group of guys comes in and all their white shirts and they're like, is there anything we can pray for you about? I broke down crying in the middle of this restaurant. I was yeah, 16 years old. And I was like, actually, yes, I just had this happen. I don't understand it. Um, And they're like, okay, we need to come to your house. And I was like, my aunt's going to think that's crazy. I just moved in here. Like you can't come to my house. (laughs) (laughs) So they had me come to their church. And I remember showing up at this little Mormon church and they're all standing around me and they put their hands on my head and they're praying. Um, They're praying that this, this demon would leave. I don't remember their exact verbiage, but I felt this whoosh like take over like just go across my whole body and I just cried out and I remember like physically feeling like this demon was gone from me and so they Mm. give me the the book of Mormon and I'm like I'm 16 I'm never gonna read this but like thank you so much for your services (laughs) (laughs) um so then I go about my life and nothing really paranormal happened to me for a while after that I got my full ride scholarship to go to college Um, I went to Indiana University. This was a huge, huge thing for me. I remember just crying in class. I've always been a very public crier. So I'm crying in class like, oh, this is another prayer answered. Like, this is how God's going to get me out of here. This is how I'm going to make something of my life. And I go to college, but yet the enemy still had this thing over me growing up in poverty and scarcity that you're never going to have enough. You're never going to be okay. You're never going to have enough to survive. So even though I had this full ride scholarship, he convinced me that this wasn't enough and I needed to do more uh, to make money. Mm. And in this program, this was a scholarship program for minority kids, first generation. um, And so they didn't want us to have jobs. They wanted us to just focus on school, focus on the meetings. Um, But for me, I wanted more. And I still had so much, I still had placed so much of my worth in physical things and material things. And going to this college, I'm seeing all these beautiful, wealthy girls from wealthy families in the sororities driving Mm -hmm. their white Mercedes. And I was like, that's who I have to be if I ever want to receive the kind of love I want to receive or Mm -hmm. be the kind of person I want to be. And so I remember just feeling like, like the only thing that stands in between me and, and that is money. And, uh, so my grandparents had both passed away around this time. They were basically my parents, Um, My grandpa passed away like as I was finishing high school. And then the summer I went to college, my grandma passed away. 
So my only anchor that I'd ever really had um, to earth uh, was now gone. So my grounding, my footing, my support system, my accountability, they were now gone. And Mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I was free falling through the world. You know, my mom was in prison again at this point. My dad Mm -hmm. and I didn't really have a close relationship. He had just gotten out of prison, but For some reason, he thought that I had received money from my grandparents' death, um, and that's how I was buying these nice things and, you know, Mm -hmm. my car. So he, like, kind of had beef with me, even though that wasn't true. Like, I was working my butt off, and then next thing I know, I'm selling my soul to have these things, and my dad thinks I got some kind of payout. So I didn't have really parents or anybody checking on me, and I remember my roommate, because we had both come from really rough childhoods and upbringings. That's how we got this scholarship program. Her and I talked each other into going to the strip club for the first time. So I was 18 years old and uh, I remember walking into the strip club and uh, feeling like a baby deer, just feeling like I don't belong here. I'm not good enough to do this. I don't know how to do this. Um, But I was willing to make money. It was about money for me. So I went ahead and did it anyways. And Mm -hmm. um, We did that for a couple months, and one guy started to get really possessive over me. He was an older man, maybe in his 70s, and anytime I would talk to anybody else, he uh, would kind of throw this fit, and I remember the girls cornered me in the locker room and were like, if you don't go out there and talk to Roy, he's going to leave, and then how are we going to pay our bills, and they were threatening me, (laughs) and so I left that day, and I never came back, but now I had this, this taste for money, like big chunks of money. And I had this taste for being able to buy what I wanted for the first time in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, how can I still have this kind of money coming in, but not be dancing or going to this club? And I also wanted to experience the college life. So now there's frat parties. And I wanted to be, like I said, one of those girls, like the sorority girl. Of course, I couldn't afford to be in a sorority, but I could still go to the frat parties. Um, So this is what led me to uh, seeking arrangements and finding sugar daddies and just doing like things I'd never imagined I would ever do for money. I was doing it. And this led to more and more substance abuse because I now had to cope Mm. more and more with what I was doing uh, for money. So I was blacked out, you know, three to four days out of the week um, Mm. on cocaine I was messed up every day, yet I was still a straight A student. So nobody ever saw any red flags. They never saw that I was hurting or (laughs) in self-destruct mode. Um, So I felt really alone in that for a while. You know, I kept on this this mindless party girl, numbing, um, coping, getting money, reckless, fast life, until I met a guy uh, freshman year of college. And uh, we were long distance, but he was from the same hometown as me. And he was kind of like what I was looking for in a guy yet my age, like he spoiled me, took care of me. Um, you know, we did expensive things together. Uh, but he was also my age and, you know, I found him attractive. And so I remember thinking like, I want to change for this guy. I want to make this relationship work. Um, but it was really hard to change on my own strength. I still fell short. Um, and we got into doing fast life things together we moved in uh, to his mom's for the summer after that freshman year of college. And this is when I got my first shoplifting charge because we were shoplifting together and selling things we shouldn't be selling together uh, without throwing him under the bus too much with what that was. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this shoplifting charge, I was by myself and it was my first time being let out of a store in handcuffs. I'd shoplifted since I was in middle school, but I'd never gotten caught. And Mm -hmm. now I was 18 years old Uh, with a full ride scholarship, uh, you know, stuff to actually lose. And I'm now getting caught for it. So this led to my first God moment because I went home uh, that summer. I'm laying in my aunt's pool and I'm staring up at the sky and I'm realizing what a mess I've made of my life. I started to realize that none of my party friends had visited me all summer. Uh, This Mm -hmm. boyfriend that I had, he kept cheating on me. Um, We had cheated on each other in the beginning, but I was loyal at this point and he was still cheating on me. So I was like, okay, so, you know, here's another thing. I hated what I was studying in school because I was studying just what I thought would make me money rather than what, Mm -hmm. what would I actually like or what would I be good at? It was always about money for me. Mm -hmm. Um, My relationship with my family was bad. There was just a lot of things going on where it's just, it was a build up climax of me realizing that I had dug a hole for myself. And so I'm laying in this pool, looking up at the sky 
And this is the first time I heard God sp- speak to me. And all I heard him say was, let me help you. Mm-hmm. And that was relieving for me because, you know, I thought he was this scary punisher kind of God. And mm-hmm. no, in my darkest time, in my time of need, he was like, let me help you. Mm. So I started watching church online and, um, you know, because I'd grown up, you know, mostly it's Christians around me. I, that's the only way I'd seen people pursue God was Christianity. So started watching, you know, Christian church online. I did my community service to get the charge expunged uh, at a church that I'd been watching online. I definitely encountered the Holy Spirit through the the pastor there. And I just started to get glimpses of God and I wanted more of that. But then I go back to my college and I went to a very liberal university that teaches, you know, at the time feminism was becoming very big and I started to get all into that ideology and like rejecting the patriarchy. And this led me into rejecting the church as well. Um, And I was like, yeah, anything like the patriarchy just wants to control us. Like, you know, I'm an 18, 18 year old thinking I know so much and uh, just start rejecting everything Western civilization. Mm. And But at the same time, I still knew I wanted God. I still knew I was deeply broken and I needed healing. So this is what led me into yoga. Really quick. I think it's interesting that just this pattern of a lot of times how God wants to come in and we're open and receptive, which you were. And then from there, it's a subtle deception starts to come in. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, because both, I say this a lot too, is both the devil and God knew I was seeking, Mm -hmm. Uh, but the the devil definitely won me over for a time, but God knew that that would be temporary and he would have victory in the end. Um, But at the time, yeah, I got into yoga and yoga opened the door to, you know, the demonic teaching of the chakras and Christ consciousness and, you know, ancient alien origins. And, you know, I got really big into all of these ideologies. And I was like, oh my gosh, the truth has been right here all along. Um, And I'd even already signed up to go on a Christian mission trip um, that I was still going to go on. And I remember going on this and like telling the leaders, like, I believe in God and I love, you know, the spirit, but I'm not a Christian. And the, the lady, the woman leader of the group ended up like shunning me for the rest of the trip. And I was like, yep, that's the hypocritical spirit of Christians that I'm not about. That's why I'm not a Christian. Oh boy, does that spirit like to come on people? Oh, yes. So this continued to confirm my growing biases. And um, then I, this was the end of sophomore year of college now. And so now I'm going to move to Arizona to be with this long distance boyfriend I'd been dating. And I didn't know how I was going to finish school. I just like trusted God. I More so I trusted the universe at this point. I was into the universe and I trusted that everything was going to work out in my favor when I got there. And Um, The moment I got to Arizona, I realized that the spiritual school I had been looking at online was right down the road from me. And I was like, oh my gosh, the universe led me here. I meant to go to this school. Um, So this is where I did my yoga teacher training. Uh, I got introduced to my first like yogi, new age, spiritual friends. This was my first community. And when I got started with this training, this was my first time seeing like tarot cards again, but they weren't the old, ugly, like yellow, red and black tarot cards. Now they're like sparkly and pretty and like these really interesting, beautiful things that I'm like, oh, this is an amazing way to connect with God. That's what I thought. So I got into the tarot cards and then, you know, it's a slippery slope from there because now that I'm in this environment and in this community, now I'm getting invited to white witch circles. Um, And I'm going to these places where uh, they're basically teaching. So at this time, I didn't mention either. I was getting into Hinduism at the same time. I had read the first canto of the Hindu Srimad Bhagavatam. And this I was reading at the same time as Jen Sincero's You Are a Badass and Gabrielle uh, Gabriella Bernstein's The Universe Has Your Back. And all these Mm -hmm. ideologies really go hand in hand with Hinduism. Um, So that's I was going to the uh, Bhakti circles and... um, so at the same time as as I'm in this yoga teacher training, I'm like, oh, this is normal. This is just like the next um, progression of this. And now I'm going to these like white witch circles where we're uh, writing our intentions for healing and these candles and we're burning them. And the thing is, is like, it's not like before I got into witchcraft, I would have thought it was like this dark, weird, eerie ritual. But once I got into it, I was like, oh, this is just like fellow broken women who are trying to heal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's how, that's how I saw it. I was like, okay, well, we're all trying to heal. We're trying to heal ourselves. We're trying to heal the collective. And, uh, 
they believe they would talk about the like the other gods and goddesses and they even had Jesus in this place but he was considered just another deity um but anytime somebody would bring up Jesus around me I went into a panic attack and I now know it as a demonic manifestation you know where the demons living in me didn't like to hear about Jesus um mm, that's good. yeah uh so while they, the other girls might have been open to Jesus as just another deity, for me, this was a, a trigger point where I wanted nothing to do with it, um, with him. And um, yeah, so I got deep into this life. I was wearing, you know, I called myself a witch. I branded my, I had a, a yoga business now. Um, my name on socials was Mindful Michaela. Um, and then I also had this guru that I met who I started following her to these weekend retreats. And, you know, it started with it started with yoga and soul gazing and um, like yoni steaming, yoni painting. Uh, the, the more sexual stuff started to get involved as as time went. Um, the yoni is the vagina. I don't know if that's a Hindu term for it or what where exactly the word yoni came from. Um, but before I know it, sh- like we're bringing sexuality into this space as another mechanism to heal another wow. form of witchcraft. Yeah. It's interesting how there's always like a sexual spin with a lot of this, these practices. Yep. Yeah. There agree? definitely was. Yeah. I mean, yoga is very sexual just in itself, just this sensual energy. Um, and this teacher really brought that and she, it was all about, you know, awakening your inner goddess, empowering the divine feminine. So of course this comes with a lot of sexuality and like basically we were naked for the whole weekend. It was naked oh, wow. rituals. Yeah. Okay. Naked rituals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this boy that I'd been dating and moved to Arizona to be with, he was now my fiance and he was like, he was used to me being, he thought I was just a little crazy, but you know, he didn't mind. Um, yeah. he also grew up Christian and had this like Christianity wound, Um, And so he's like, oh, whatever she wants to do, you know, that's fine. So this opens the portal to me going back into the strip clubs again, because now sexuality is being very desensitized for me in this quote unquote healing space. Um, And I was, that's what I was thinking as you were talking is is this connection, like the enemy wanted to bring you back into that and use these different portals, like you said. Exactly. So now I'm thinking, okay, me being sexual is a part of me healing, is a part of me empowering my divine feminine, awakening my inner goddess. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back to the strip club this time because at the same time, my fiance had run out of money and um, he was about to leave for an army training. And I had to figure out, I was still a full-time student, still teaching yoga. So I didn't want to get a full-time job on top of that. It was impossible in my eyes. So I was like, how can I, you know, make money on the side? Oh, I know exactly what to do. I'll strip and this will be another part of my healing. So I thought I could go into that and be completely sober. But before I knew it, um, I'm drinking again. I'm doing cocaine in the bathroom with girls again. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it was just a slippery slope of now I'm coping and numbing because I'm making these compromises with my soul um, because you get presented large sums of money in spaces like that for just these little compromises, but these little compromises become bigger and bigger and you don't realize that they're chipping away at the depths of your soul and your identity. Um, So my coping started to get out of hand again. Um, And this is actually where I met a married man. And uh, my relationship with my fiance at this point, just to kind of go back to, you know, we had brought in so many of these pagan beliefs that it started to warp his perception of religion and spirituality as well. So now we have this kind of open relationship dynamic uh, Mm -hmm. where he's coming to the club and getting dances from girls. Um, He starts bringing up ideas of like, you know, we started having like basically uh, like orgies. I'll just say the word, I'll just call it what it is. Like we started having these, you know, other couples, other situations. Like we were like, hardcore living out a pagan lifestyle. Mm. So, and he thought me stripping was hot. Uh, Mm -hmm. He was definitely, you know, I could look at him now and I'm like, he was just as lost and confused as I was. Like I don't demonize him at all because he had church hurt. He was lost and confused as well. Uh, But now being married to a man who knows and loves the Lord, I'm like, he would never, he would never let me be in this situation. He would protect me. He would pull me out. Like, um, but but this guy, we were still so young. You were both in a bad spot. You you were in it together. 
exactly. Yeah. We, we created that situation together. Um, so now being in this club environment, I meet this married man and I fall head over heels. Like when they say that, well, when the Bible says that the enemy, that Satan casts himself as an angel of light, mm. that's what this man did. Like he came in and it, the devil knows how to appeal to all of our like deepest fleshly desires and fantasies. This man was exactly what mm. my flesh wanted. Um, what got me my all my weaknesses of course and you couldn't have him because he's married so that added to it yeah yeah to the attraction for sure um, and he came in for a bachelor party so he was only in my city for the weekend and um, yeah so I ended up giving him my real name um, I got called to dance in their section I didn't think like I thought only the pro strippers went and danced in that section. I didn't know, like, I still, like, I've had such self-worth issues my whole life, uh, just growing up, you know, with the abuse and everything that I remember when I saw the bachelor party come in and the celebrity stage get opened, I was like, oh, this is definitely just for like the experienced strippers. Like I'm not going to get called in there. And next thing I know, the DJ is calling my name to go in there and I'm like having a panic attack. I try to talk him out of it. Um, he's like, but I don't know if you've ever met a DJ from a strip club. They are ruthless. He's like, get in there now. So uh -huh. I go in there and all these guys are just going crazy. And I realize now it's like, of course I was young, vulnerable, innocent, like naive, you know, it's like easy to take advantage of and to sexualize and just, um, yeah. So I remember thinking, oh, I'm not old and mature at this. So nobody's going to like me, but no, I, I ended up getting more attention than I expected. And I was getting attention from everybody but this guy that I had been watching. Mm. And finally, he comes up to me and asked me for a dance. And before, like, I just felt like our souls, like, knew each other. Because now I'm into all this, you know, new age belief system. And I'm just feeling like our souls have always known each other. And uh, yeah, the, the demons that were living in us definitely did recognize each other. And this was the start of an eight-month relationship um, next thing I know, he's getting a territory in my city because he lived in LA. I lived in Tempe. Um, he got a territory for his sales business close to where I lived. And I was like, oh my gosh, the universe is bringing us together. Um, we're doing tarot cards together. He, he was a Christian, mind you, but he was a backslidden Christian who was living in his sin, living in rebellion, doing tarot cards, going to demons instead of God. And the tarot cards are telling us, you know, you're meant to be together. Uh, there's going to be initial pain and destruction, which I interpreted was divorce. Um, but you guys are meant to be together in the end. So we're going about this relationship at the same time. So now I'm moving out of the house with my fiance. We break up. Um, we're still friends. Like I still, I still loved him, but I just wasn't in love with him. I couldn't be with him. I wanted nothing but the best for him, but I was like, I have to, I have to go my separate way. And so I moved into my own apartment for the first time. And now I'm like, I'm grappling with what I thought was God. Um, but now I know, you know, I was, I definitely wasn't talking to God, um, but mm -hmm. God still had me. He still had my back. Mm -hmm. um, but I was asking this question of what is my purpose? Like, really, like, what, what am I here for? You know, I'm moving into this apartment. My whole life is changing. I thought I was going to marry this guy. Now I'm not. Like, I was just at another kind of breaking point. Mm -hmm. And my answer to everything at this point was psychedelics. That's where I felt like I connected with God the most. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do psychedelics and I'm going to find an answer for, you know, what I'm, what I'm here for. So I didn't know I was asking demons. I was literally like, Hey demons, what's my purpose? Um, and so this trip starts and I remember I was, I took my dog outside because I didn't want to be in my apartment. And I began to feel like it setting in, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm about to be weird. So I need to get back into my apartment. So we come back in my apartment and I just feel this heaviness overtake me. And it's so bad that like I face plant on my bed. Like I literally like crashed to my bed and I'm sitting there looking at my dresser. I had this like white antique, like European style dresser, like swirly designs. And I'm just mm -hmm. like looking at these designs and I close my eyes for just a second and I see this spaceship coming my way and it has these like, like almost like tentacles pointing at me, coming mm -hmm. directly at me. And it feels like terror, like it's, it's terrifying. And so I open my eyes and I don't see it. I close my eyes and it's closer. 
open my eyes, I don't see it. Close my eyes, it's it's even closer. And in this moment, God the Father, like how I would envision him to be, there's like, it's like my room like transforms into this white lab and there's this translucent layer behind me. And I'm seeing like this like sort of like blurry vision of God behind me. And all he said is, you don't have to go in there. And I was like, no, I need to know if there's aliens. I need to know if there's a great mother. Like at that point, I was really into, you know, seeking the great mother. I I wanted to do ayahuasca so bad. I never got into it, but um, God protect me from from that. But I want to know if there's a great mother. I was really into aliens. I thought we were descended from aliens, that they were like the original creators. So I was like, no, I need to know. I need to know. And so I ate the fruit. I freaking ate the apple and (laughs) I had that free will to do so. So the moment he, what happened? Yes. So the moment he like lets me have my choice, panic sets in. Like I'm in a full blown panic attack now because, you know, he let me make my decision and now the demons are here in my apartment. And I didn't even know that. So I go to my dog because I'm like full on in panic mode. And my dog has always been my comforter going back to the beginning, my dog. Mm -hmm. Um, And my dog is looking at me terrified. Like he's trembling. He's literally trembling, looking at me. And this is my baby. Like this is my, like he knows I'm mommy. And he, but Um, he knew he saw something else. They sense spirits, don't they? Yes. He saw something else looking back at him. And he's like, that's not my mom. Mm. So the demons had full blown infiltrated me at this point. And I'm in panic mode. I can't figure out what can bring me peace. I had no peace, no rest. So I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to go to the shower. Cause I had always like, I'd always been drawn to water. Whenever I was on shrooms, I would go into the water and I would channel, um, you know, if I was in a creek in Sedona, I would be channeling messages to my friends. Um, Or if I was in my bathtub at the old house, I remember just feeling connected to the spirit and water. Um, So I was like, I'm going to go into the shower. So I'm standing in the shower. And before I know it, I see these aliens like in this translucent layer around me. And I almost see them like coming through my shower curtain. I had this like marble textured shower curtain, but I'm seeing in the spirit that they're lining up around me and they're telepathically communicating with me. And I'm like, listen, I'm like, if you want to talk to me, you got to appear in a way that's way less scary to me right now, because like, this is very scary. So they project themselves as this feminine, like she had horns and a tail. And I'm seeing this, this sexy, like kitty esque woman now in their place and they're telling me that's you they're telling me that's you i was seeking my purpose remember and so they're telling me like basically i'm getting the feeling that my life is going to be camcorded i'm going to like a webcam girl this is before only fans got really popular but that's basically what they were telling me i'm seeing wow. this vision yeah i'm seeing this of vision of be, yes of. yes yes They're giving me this vision of this luxury upscale apartment with purples and oranges and like me walking around and my whole life is recorded. And I'm this sexy kitty, like goddess woman that people pay to watch. And that's my purpose. And so I was like, okay, I was like, that's me. That's crazy. (sighs) Yes. So I go about my life now. The people who know and love me are starting to be a little alarmed by the things I'm saying. Um, I was full blown, you know, demonically oppressed and possessed all the things at this point. And I go on this trip home to Indiana cause I was trying to find myself still figure my life out, just moved into this apartment and I come back and what I would call this journey back. Cause I road trip this, I drove it. The journey back from Indiana was my trip out of hell. Uh, weird things were happening in my car. I was with my friend. Um, my friend is still, she still doesn't believe in Jesus, but she saw some of the things I saw and like, she, she, she knows like she, I believe one day she will come to believe she just has to, you know, surrender. But anyways, there's like a spider outbreak in my car. There's this, uh, there's this car with like sacred geometry, the, the demonic, you know, geometry mandalas all over the car. And it's fall. It's, it's like with us every stop from Indiana to almost Colorado. This car was with us at every hotel, gas station, just kind of on the same path as us. Yeah, we ended up at this really creepy motel where the owner 
was it he was like a I don't know if he was on meth or what but he like hid behind the cleaning cart and like everything was just creepy and demonic the the hotel we were at in Colorado we saw somebody get pulled out in a gurney um the ambulance was there and then when we make it to Arizona I take her to Sedona you know one of the most spiritual cities and we end up in this like psychic shop with this Native American man and all this alien, ancient alien artwork. And like we're looking in this kaleidoscope as well. And now looking back, I, I compare my time in the new age as to looking in this kaleidoscope because it's so beautiful and sparkly. But every time you you think that you've set your gaze on something or you've, you're on a sturdy foundation, it turns and you're falling through the universe seeking for truth and stability all over again. Um, <laughs> wow, Michaela, that that sums it up, encapsulates it beautifully. Wow, yeah, that's so true. yeah. God was God helped me piece all these conclusions together after the fact, but at the time, I'm just going through this chaos. My friend and I are like, "What's going on? Like, this is crazy." Um, and so we make it to Arizona, and at this point, like, I'm like a full blown shaman. Like, I lead people on psychedelic trips. We go out into the woods, and my friend has been watching me. She's my hometown friend. She's been watching me do this on social media for a while at this point. And so she's like, "I want to, I want to experience this." And I was like, "Oh yes, you need to experience this. Like, it, it gets you so close to God and the spirit world." So I'm like, "I'm going to lead you on a trip." So we go on this psychedelic trip, and. Uh, this is when like God began to remove the veil for me. This is when I first started seeing like demons and, but I didn't know it was demons. Like it's really mm -hmm. crazy. I just thought I was seeing weird, like kind of wicked spirits. Mm -hmm. um, so we end up at this lake with some of my acquaintances and there's this guy, he's kind of freaking out. He's like, Michaela, can you lead me through some breaths? Um, I, I'm really like freaking out. He was going through a breakup and I was like, yes, this is what I was born to do. Like I'm a, I'm a new age yogi healer. Let me just lead you through some breaths. <laughs> so it's like two in the morning. I'm leading this guy through breaths. And as I'm, my eyes are closed, I'm sensing like dead things all around him. I'm feeling like we're in the bottom of the ocean. I'm seeing skeletons around and like just getting this deep, dark bottom of the ocean vibe from him. Mm. And when he comes back, he sits back up and he's like, I think I feel better. But his face is not him. Um, his jaw is going out way past where it should be. His eyes are bugged. And I see a sea urchin in him. I see a sea urchin. And Damn. my friend who doesn't believe in all this stuff that I'm talking about now, she saw it too. And she will admit that she saw this spirit in him too. So I was like, okay, we have to get home. It's now two in the morning. I'm like, I'm 22 years old. Like what is going on? I'm out here at two in the morning. Like, like what is happening with my life? This is another, like, what is happening with my life moment? And uh, yeah, so I get back to my apartment. Life goes on. Anyways, now I'm back with this man that I'm in the relationship with. And um, once again, he's a Christian. And we're we're now taking our life together more seriously. Like we're looking he's at how married, right? He's, he's still married. Um, and in fact, two months into our relationship, he told me his wife was seven months pregnant. But at this point, I was already like, I was already you know, addicted to this relationship that at that point. And I remember not knowing what to do. And he just had kept telling me from the beginning, like, oh, it's, it's, it's been over. Like we're over at this point. He was living separately. He wasn't even living at home anymore. So I was like, okay, they're separated, whatever. I didn't have Christian values. Um, so I didn't have that same like moral compass that no, he's married. Even if he says he's separated, it doesn't matter. So for me, I'm like, oh no, he's separated, whatever. Mm. So we're talking about our next steps of life together. I'm envisioning like what it would be like to be a stepmom because he has two other kids. Um, we're looking at houses in California together. Uh, mm -hmm. And I began to read the Bible here and there because that's what he believed in. He wasn't obeying it, but I'm reading the Bible here and there. And uh, the first things that God began to speak to me about were sexual immorality and the fact that he was coming back soon. Mm. Um, and so even though I didn't fully believe in the Bible yet, I was mm. like, I think this thing, like these parts, something was just speaking, like the, the seeds were planted. So anyways, I have this date with him. And this is, like I said, we're at like a turning point in our relationship. Like I'm going to leave the club. I'm figuring out what I'm doing with my life. Like, what's my purpose? I'm like, I want to be a teacher, a leader, speaker. Like I'm not just a dancer. I'm just doing this part-time or like temporary is what I would say. And, um, I remember this night we went on a date and we came back to the hotel room and I just felt this like anxiety enter the room going back to how demons come with a spirit of fear. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But I didn't know that's what was happening. I thought maybe I was just feeling insecure about something. I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm like breaking out. I have acne um, right now. And he looks at me from across the room and he's like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you all the way over there? And I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm just insecure right now. So he dims the lights and comes over to me and he sits me down on the bed and he's telling me I'm beautiful and everything's okay and we're okay. And um, he's looking at me and as he's looking at me, his face begins to morph. And at this point, I had seen some crazy things, but I was always under the influence of something when I'd seen these things. Mm. On this day, I was completely sober. Wow. Wow. So I'm seeing his face morph and I don't even know what to say or what to do. I'm just seeing his eyes go out past his head further than they should up and down, left and right. And like, I, yeah, I just didn't even know what to say yet. And then his face begins to, it's like, he's now taking on these animalistic features. His nose becomes a snout. I'm seeing a gorilla in his forehead. And at this point I'm like petrified. And all I could get out was, I see a beast in you. I just looked at him and said, I see a beast in you. And he said, I see the same thing. I don't know if he was or not, if it was mirroring itself back or if that was just something he said. But he like is now sitting down in front of me. And you both are sober, completely sober. Both. He never did. He never did drugs or anything like that unless I talked him into something here and there. But he was a, a 32 year old man focused on his business. He wasn't into partying and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so he was completely sober. The main portal that he had been opening was tarot cards with demons and a sexually immoral, adulterous relationship. These were his main portals. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so now we're sitting there looking at each other and he turns completely black like a black silhouette. And it almost looked like, you know, that yogi chakra silhouette that's sitting there with the legs crossed. It's black and you see colorful lights coming behind Mm -hmm. it. This is what he looked like. I see this blue orish light coming behind it. And Mm -hmm. as I'm like looking at the blackness, I begin to pass out. Like I'm so afraid. I almost lost consciousness slash like this thing was sucking my soul. It's both sucking my soul. And I was like terrified and about to pass out. So right as I'm about to pass out, I see these like yellow evil eyes shoot through and it just, yeah, this just like shakes me. And then he grabs me by my shoulders and he's like, this isn't a good spirit. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, Obviously, I know at this point. So he gets yeah. up on his knees and he's squeezing my hands and he's breathing really hard. And I'm like, this is his battle. I'm watching him fight this demon. I'm like, this is his battle. But even though he was a Christian, he didn't call on Jesus. And when I reflected on looking back is that he didn't want to give up his sin. He wasn't mm-hmm. ready to repent and call on Jesus yet. He That's he was so playing good. with this demon. Yeah. He knew yep. this demon had come in and he wasn't ready to give up that life yet. So he's, he's trying to fight it on his own. You know, he's squeezing his hands, my hands breathing really hard. And this demon begins to cast this illusion on his face that he's being strangled. I see his mm-hmm. face turning purple, his eyes bulging out of his head. And Looking back, I'm like, yeah, he really was being strangled in his own sin. He really was being strangled. Like this demon really did have this grip on him. And this demon, I was seeing this. I was seeing this. And my legs are wrapped around him at this point. And I began to feel so unsafe, like sexually. And I I just got this like information. Like God just told me this demon wants you for sex. Whoa. Wow. Wow. So that's why God had been speaking to me about abstinence and sexual immorality. And then revealing that to you, this is what it is. Yeah. In such a way that you believed it and were scared. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I needed the fear of the Lord. I, I yeah. joke like I was the rebellious bad kid who needed like a little bit more mm. discipline. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. God had to reveal to me and show me the truth of what I was messing with. So this rocked my world, needless to say. Um, the next four hours we were just like, what was that? Like, what the heck? Like, why this come in? What does this mean? Um, so four hours had gone by or so, and we're trying to sleep and I'm just so afraid. And I was like, finally I asked him, I'm like, you're a Christian. Can you pray? Can you just pray? Mm. And so he prays for us, but I still feel like, uh, you know, I still feel the demon in the room, even though he prayed. And so now going back to my first demonic encounter when I was 16, and this demon was telepathically communicating with me. This new demon was telepathically, because that's how they they commu- they whisper stuff into our mind. They can't read our thoughts, but they can tell us things in our mind. So this demon is telling me, 
who are you to pray? Why would you, you're not going to pray. Why would you pray? You don't even believe in Jesus. He's like warring me, but the more aggressive this voice is getting, the more the Holy Spirit is convincing me, you need to pray. You need to pray, especially yeah. the more this demon started fighting me. Wow. So like, this is like a critical moment I'm feeling. <laughs> oh, this was pinnacle. Okay. So tears streaming down my face. Like I am humbled to the core. I had a whole YouTube channel where I was blaspheming Jesus before, blaspheming the church, saying it's all the patriarchy. Um, you know, like I'm just humbled in this moment and I'm crying out to Jesus. And I'm like, Jesus, please protect us. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't really know what else to say beyond that, but I'm just like, please protect us. Just please. I, I just pray for your protection, God. Thank you so much. Like, that's all I could say, but that was enough. You know, mm-hmm. that was enough. Um, so mm-hmm. I asked him, you know, I basically invited him into my life at that point, but we left this experience and I came back and I was grappling because I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to be a Christian though. Like, I'm not trying to be a Christian. I didn't, you know, I didn't like Christians. I didn't like Christianity. Um, I still wasn't super sure I believed in Jesus at this point. So I'm looking into all the other religions, like how do they protect themselves from evil? I'm like, how do you let in like demons? Like, what did I do? I'm like, was it the drugs? Was it the strip club? Was it the relationship? I just started taking like this big inventory of my life. Little did I know it was all of those things. It was all of the sins Mm -hmm. that let in demons. Um, So I was just taking this inventory. And at the same time, uh, you know, I was considering Jesus too. I'm like, you're considering all these other religions, like consider the Bible too. So I was reading it here and there. And I reached out to the one Christian I knew in all of Arizona. She was, there was one Christian in my whole yoga teacher training. And I used to hate her. Like I used to hate her when I was in the training. And the moment I see the demon and I had no support system, like I had nobody. So I reach out to this woman and she's like, please just come to church with me. Mm. And so I go to church with her and I remember thinking like I was going to hate it. It was going to be terrible. And I'm sitting there in this church and I'm just feeling God like tell me that this is the truth. So at the same time, you know, I was going to the Catholic church, getting holy water. I was looking up what do Hindus do? What do Buddhists do? I went to the Mormon church, was asking them like I was going everywhere. But when I was at the Christian church, I felt this sense of peace and like affirmation that this is the truth. Um, And I know people say, oh, the Catholic Church is still Christianity. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But um, that's that's not my point right now. I'm I'm not refuting that. But I am saying when I was at, you know, just this normal Christian church, I was like, Jesus in the Bible or this is this is there. I think this is true. Um, Mm. So I started reading the Bible more after that. And man, it was it was really like that was like a a turning point for me. And I began to realize if even though all the other religions might be true i needed jesus to fight this battle for me like after seeing something so scary and demonic i was like i can't fight that on my own while all the other moral philosophies might be true Mm. um i can't fight this on my own i need i need somebody to fight this with me and that's what kept bringing me more and more to jesus but i tell you like i didn't just become a christian overnight like it was a a real grappling with god and really like living out biblical principles and observing it over time the fruit for me to see that oh this wasn't just a man-made book meant to control society but no god really told us these things to keep us protected and it took me a couple more times um falling back into sin with this man trying to let this relationship go and falling back into sin with this man for me to realize that what God told us in the Bible was to keep us protected, to keep our hearts and souls protected. Because Mm -hmm. I began to realize after I did take sex out of the relationship that he really did just want me for sex. It might've been love for me, but it was just less for him. He Mm -hmm. was in his rebellion and um, the demon was using him and my demons were using me, you know, to be in this demonically, you know, impure relationship. And so the more we got abstinent, the more that became clear um, that this was not inspired by God, but this relationship was inspired by demons. Mm. Michaela, that is so powerful and profound, just everything that you were shown and knowing that he's patient and kind and, you know, he's willing to show us in a gradual way and help us through that. And he, and he fought your battles. So then from there, you couldn't really be completely free until you got out of that relationship. And so how did you finally end that relationship? Oh, it was hard. It was, that was probably one of the hardest things I did. Um, 
and the way I look at it too, it's like, I don't know if it was completely about that man or if that man was kind of like a mascot for how I'd lived my life leading up to that point and just kind of, you know, the final character to the kinds of men that I'd been with my whole life. Mm -hmm. So it was giving up a version of me, a version of my identity, a whole Mm -hmm. lifestyle in giving up that relationship. Um, And so I had started going to the church and I started going to women's groups with Tammy, my friend who brought me to church. And I went to freedom classes and I was like, I had to be in the church three to four days a week um, Mm -hmm. to have the support and the Um, the wisdom from wise women uh, pouring truth over me and teaching me what God says and telling me, you know, God is not the God of confusion. He's not going to send a married man into your life. He doesn't want this pain, this confusion for you. If it doesn't come with peace, it's not from God because I was really grappling. I was grappling with that. I'm like, well, maybe he is my man, but like, we just have to get through Mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. Like I was so confused, you know, but it took really diving into the church. So, yeah. And I just love how you said he kind of represented so much of your past and what you went through. And as soon as you were able to end that and that chapter, you were able to truly start with God because he wants us all in to to be able to experience all that he has. And so speaking of experiencing all that he has, that's when you really became, came into your destiny. Tell us about what happened from there. Oh my gosh. We still have time. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. I know I've talked a lot. Um, yeah. So after that, you know, the process of letting go of that relationship also paired with me really like fighting with God. Cause I was like, okay, I'm sacrificing so much. Like I now believe that the, Bi- like you gave us the Bible for a reason and it's to keep us protected, but I still wasn't a hundred percent sure that Jesus was God. And so I was like, I need to know that I know that I know for me to be okay with sacrificing so much, like sacrificing this, this, what I thought was love, this identity, this version of myself. And so I prayed, like I was praying for months for God to just like fully, like, just like reveal himself to me. And he did that in pieces across the months. But finally, January of 2021, I had this really scary dream. (laughs) This dream is in two parts. I had the first dream was just like, it was just darkness. And I, it was another like sleep paralysis dream where I was asleep, but I was awake. I woke up in this dream and I was walking through my apartment and I got lifted up, like levitated and thrown into a black abyss of darkness. This happened three times of me getting, and I almost feel like it's symbolic of my journey. Like I first came to God when I was 18, but then I got thrown into darkness because I got confused. And then I, you know, I woke up again and then I was thrown into darkness again and the new age. And so it was almost symbolic of my journey. But this dream ended in me getting thrown into darkness again. And then I woke up the next day and I had to go to work. And I was like, what the heck is that about? So <laughs> two days later, I have the sequel to this dream. Mm-hmm. Thank God he didn't just leave it at that. Um, so the sequel to this dream is I was in this black abyss. Now I'm like, I see where I'm at. You know, I got thrown into the black abyss. Now I get to see what that is. So I'm in this black abyss and there's nothing around me. There's no oxygen. There's no peace. I can't move, but I'm restless. No light, nothing. And it's like a terrible, like this is like my hell. This was my hell. And from Mm -hmm. a distance, I saw this little beam of light. And just seeing this Mm -hmm. beam of light gave me hope that, okay, there's light out there. There's light out there somewhere. Like it might not be here, but it's out there. So I can at least be a little bit hopeful that there's something. But no, like in the matter of just like milliseconds, like light seconds, this light zooms up to me and it's all around me. And it comes with this sound of like, and like I feel this warmth all around me. And this light is completely encapsulating me. And finally, my body rests. I'm just like floating now. I'm just, I'm breathing. I'm floating. I feel peace. (sighs) And then through the center of this light comes the face of Jesus. And I was like, okay, it's Jesus. You're the one. Like, you're the one. You've been with me all along. This was finally, like, this wasn't just a dream. This was me experiencing Mm -hmm the love and salvation of God and him giving me that peace in my soul that it was really him. And so after I knew that I went public on my YouTube 
And, uh, you know, I'm posting all about my transformation. I'm telling all my new age friends. A lot of them think I'm crazy. They're like, oh, demons are just a projection of your shadow self. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I used to believe that too. I was like, but I saw it and it was not me. Like it wasn't just a projection of me. Like this demon was real. It was something outside of myself. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus is real. Like I was telling people urgently. I'm telling my YouTube. I'm just passionate about it. And, um, you know, I lost a lot of followers, but that was okay. Mm -hmm. And Jesus helped me rebrand myself. I gave up mindful Michaela. I just came back to my name, Michaela Renee. Mm -hmm. Michaela Renee I came back to And I just home. see such a joy and peace on you, Michaela. It's amazing. Thank I love you. It. And going back to that, you know, you prayed that prayer. You needed a final, like, if, like you said, if I'm going to do all this, Lord, if I'm going all in with you, give me something. And that is the most beautiful vision. It was like a vision he gave you on that. Yes. It's almost like you were in this dark hell and then he came and showed you and confirmed. 100%. A hundred percent. I'd been in hell like that whole time. Yeah. And he showed me, he's the one that pulled me out of there. And the more mm -hmm. I lived my life according to his ways and his teachings, the better my life got, the better my relationships got, the better my re reputation got. Um, and I ended up meeting my husband like almost a year after that, not quite a full year, but I'd made a full list. It took me getting to know Jesus first. I was like, okay, I need to figure out who Jesus is. So I know what to look for and an actual husband this time and, you know, not mess this thing up. Cause that was the biggest thing I'd always been looking for since I was a little girl was love. I just wanted love. I had that parental void of love. And mm -hmm. so that's what led me into the promiscuity and like trying to be enough in college. And uh, all of it was this pursuit of love. And so first I had to come to terms with the love of God and know that Jesus was real. And then understanding who Jesus was helped me know what to look for in a husband. Um, and then I found my husband and uh, kind of just spent a year quiet from the socials. And mm -hmm. it was about a year into our marriage that I was like, okay, I'm ready to like tell the world again. And that's what finally led me to starting Raised and Redeemed um, is I I wanted to start living for God. You know, after I got solidified in my marriage, I'm like, I need to be telling the world about God, having conversations about God. Um, so that's what finally led me to that, where now I have now I know my purpose. And it's crazy because, you know, first and foremost, our purpose is to know and to love God. Um, and then secondly, everything kind of comes from there. But the demons tried to hijack God's purpose for me. And they told me, oh, you're going to be online. You're going to be, you know, a webcam. Like you're going to get paid for this sexual stuff, a, a counterfeit version of what God really had for me. Because now you see, like I have this online presence and brand and I'm speaking for the glory of God online. Mm -hmm. And the demons tried to thwart that and telling me it was, you know, this sexual counterfeit version. But, you know, yeah. God knew his plan all along. I love that. I love that. It's so true. It's always the counterfeit that, and then God shows you the real thing. So yes, that is where people can find you. You have an amazing podcast called Raised and Redeemed, right? Yes. Yes. And you're just, and just want to add to that now you and your husband are expecting, which is yes. amazing. <laughs> so Michaela, you truly do have a story of redemption. And would you just Tell us one thing that you would like to, for all the people that are listening that have maybe gone through a hard time in their childhood or struggling, what would you say to them from your story? That's a, that's a big question. Um, but, you know, I feel like the thing that's coming to mind is just that God can handle the ugly parts. He can handle the parts of our story that scare us and make us feel shameful. He, he wants us to come to him with those things. And, uh, let him help us, you know, going back to that first message that he said to me, um, one of the first stories that meant so much to me was when I read about the story of Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant who um, got illegitimately pregnant with Abraham's son and then ran off into the wilderness and encountered God there, uh, the angel of the Lord. And she was just so in awe. She was like, you are the God who sees me. And I think that's how I felt for so long, you know, being abused and neglected and abandoned and not feeling like I had love was just feeling like I was in that dark pit, that that hell all by myself for so long. But he sees me and it was his light that pulled me out of that. Um, and so just to give them that affirmation that he is the God who sees you and he he knows where you are and he can pull you out of that darkness. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. 
Thank you so much for sharing, Michaela. This has been truly a blessing for me and I know many that are listening. And could you just pray for us and those listening? Absolutely. You feel like you want to pray? Okay. Yes. Oh, dear Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for just what you've revealed to me, God, and maybe what you're mm-hmm. revealing to the listeners right now just in their own lives and maybe through the hearing of this testimony today, God. I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to them. I pray that uh, you would give them the courage to just pray those bold prayers and really ask you to show up and and to show yourself so that you, you have the opportunity to meet them there, God, that they would just have open hearts to you. Um, and a willingness to know you, God, and to just test out your ways, God, to test out what you say in the Bible and how you instruct us to live our lives, God, that they would test it and know that the fruits are good, the fruits are good, God, and that you can restore their lives. I pray this all in your name, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen.